All right, uh, we're going to be looking today at work for the night is coming. John 9 verse 4 is our uh, platform to go off of our springboard as it were. John 9 4, Jesus is talking. He says, I must work the works of him that sent me. I've got to do what my dad sent me to do while it's day. The night's coming when no man can work. Now notice how Jesus takes personal, individual, he's got to do something, and then he pluralizes it when he says there's coming a time when nobody can do anything. Which implies that though he did what he had to do, there's something for us to do. I must do, Jesus said, what my father told me to do while I'm here, while it's still day. But the night's coming when none of you will be able to do anything else. The Bible tells us elsewhere to occupy. And we, we think of the word occupy, I'm taking up space. That's not really what the Greek word means. The Greek word means to do the merchandise, do the marketing of, do the business of. Okay? So we are to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. We, are to, we have a job to do. And God says through Jesus, he says, there's coming a time when you won't be able to do it. So get it done. So I'm going to talk to you today about working for Jesus Christ. All right? I've got eight points. So here we go. Point number one. Honest work. Honest work equals nourishment. Let's see what it says here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. For even when ye were, when I was with you, this we commanded you. If you don't work, you don't eat. Okay? Now, if you want to take this verse and apply it to governmental programs and, and socialism and uh, free enterprise and welfare, uh, you can apply it to politics if you want, but I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to tell you is, God said, if you're not earning your keep, you don't get your keep. Now, let's put that on a spiritual level. If I work, and because I do this activity, I, 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 we'll call it work, I'm working, for you, at the end of the week, you're going to pay me my wages, right? Was the wages a gift or a payment? It's a payment. I earned it. Now, salvation is a gift. It's not a payment. But our rewards, we earn. How do we earn them? What's the Bible say our rewards are based on? You are rewarded by what you did, by your works. So here we say, we compare these scriptures, if you don't work for God, if you don't do what God wants you to do, when, where, how he wants you to do it, you don't get the reward. Not the, not, not the gift. You get the salvation. You already got it. But you don't get the, if you don't do your job, you don't get paid. It's not a union. Okay? Somebody's phone? Or Jenny? That's all right. So when you have a job to do, and I encourage you, I implore you, I beg you, find out what it is God wants you to do, and then do it. Now, are there some things that God wants all of us to do? Yeah. yeah. Are there some things God wants specific ones of us to do and others not to do? But they never conflict. And say, so you walk around, oh, I don't know what God wants me to do. Listen to me, this is really easy. Because Jesus said this, and I'm paraphrasing Jesus. Jesus said, I'm not going to give a lot of time instructing you on the specificity of your calling if you won't do what you're supposed to do, what everybody's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Put it now. You're not cleaning up your room, you're not making your bed, you're, 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 uh, your dirty clothes never make it to the hamper. Why am I going to waste my time giving you more instruction? You won't even do what you're supposed to do. Spiritually, you don't read your Bible. You don't pray. You don't have a. You don't. You don't develop that relationship with me. You don't attend the church. You don't support the ministry. Okay. You have chosen to be ignorant. Understand the definition of the word ignorant. It means to ignore. Doesn't mean you're stupid. Stupid's different. Doesn't mean you're dumb. That's something different. Doesn't mean that you're, you're a moron. That's a whole different thing. Ignorant means it's right in front of me and I ignore it. Do you know what the will of God is for your life? Well, I'm not really sure. Ask him. 
Develop a relationship with him and then listen when he talks and do what he says. If you don't work, you don't get the reward. If you don't work, you don't eat. That's the principle. Now, can we say, well, if you don't work, you don't eat, therefore... The principle I have to understand. I, if I want to be rewarded, if I want to get the food from God, as it were, I've got to do the work that he called, told me to do. For, verse 11, for he here... My, I can't read without my glasses. For we hear that we there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with, with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But you, brethren, don't be weary in well-doing. Notice the, the admonition he says here. If you don't work, you don't eat. Now, there are some of you out there, and you know, you know who you are, and you know who I'm talking about, but I won't name them. They're busybodies. They show up at all the eating functions and never at the cleanup functions. Okay? I'm commanding them, by the word of the Lord, stop that. Now, the rest of you, don't see them and follow their example. Don't be weary in well-doing. You keep doing what you're supposed to do. Ladies and gentlemen, look at me. Everybody, eyes up here. Look at me. You do not have to please anyone but God. Don't try to please the guy next to you or across the table from you. In your heart, please God. And if they're living their lives to please God, you'll get along. You'll fellowship with one another. Please God. Stop trying to please yourself. Stop trying to please others. Set it in your heart to please God. Don't be weary in well-doing. So honest work brings us nourishment. Number two, faithful work brings us rest. Come unto me, all ye that are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Who's saying this? Jesus. He said, if you are burdened down with stuff you've got to get done, and there is a physical aspect to this, and there is a spiritual aspect to this. Now look at me. I'm going to, I'm going to divide something that really shouldn't be divided, but, but for illustration, I'm going to divide it. So first of all, is everybody in here in the room right now a Sunday school teacher or a pastor? Okay, we're not all, right? So let's, let's, for the sake of illustration, not doctrine, for the sake of illustration, let's put church workers over here, and they're doing spiritual stuff. Now, don't do this in real life. This is illustrative. Here's the church workers. They're doing spiritual stuff. And here's you bagging groceries. You're doing carnal stuff. Now, that... That's not doctrinal. This is illustrious. I, I, I've got to emphasize this so you don't miss it. Okay? Can you be burdened with getting your lesson ready, your song ready, cleaning the church building? Can you? Can you be burdened with the work? I'm bagging groceries and I got a long. Can you be burdened with any of those? Okay, so if you want to, for the sake of illustration, have a, a, a separation. But really, even if you're not a church worker full-time, as they call it, aren't we all full-time church workers? But our profession, the thing, that, the thing that we do most of the time or get paid for or whatever, that might be different, but you really can't separate those two. Look at me. I, this is not the message today, but understand, sometimes you've heard the separation between the godly and the secular. There is no such thing for a Christian. If you're living for God, anything you do in society is part of God's will for you, and you're supposed to be doing it to honor him. There's no separation between the secular and the sacred. There's, there's no difference. If I'm sweeping a street and I'm a Christian, I'm sweeping the street for God. I'll stay off of that for now. There's a whole other sermon I got working on, okay? So come unto me, you're heavy laden, you're burdened spiritually, carnally, if you will, but they're really, they, they go together. 
if you give that to God, he says, I'll give you rest. Are you worn out? Let God give you rest. Now, are you doing the work that you're doing for God, for self? Look at me. If you're doing it for self, you've got to give yourself rest. How much rest can you give yourself? Now, look at me. I'm, I'm trying to help you think this through. If, think in your life, there were times you tried because you were worn out and tuckered out and all flustered and all that, and you said, I'm taking a day off. How many of you have ever done that and really got the rest you thought you wanted? Or at the end of the time of your day off, you were just as, how many of you ever come back from, you come home from vacation tired? You get the point? If you're trying to give yourself rest, you can't. God says, come to me. I'll give you the rest. Okay? Take my yoke upon you. Pull the plow. Pull the harrow. Pull the combine. Pull. Put the yoke on. And learn of me. Look at me. You cannot learn of God if you're not working for him. I'll give you a personal illustration. You're going to fit this however you want to do it. I taught science and history for the most part, a lot of other things, but I taught science and history for 30 years. I learned more about history as a teacher than I ever did as a student. Because I had to keep ahead of the students. When I was a student, I could fake my way through and pass the test. But as a teacher, when a kid raises his hand and says, well, what about George Washington? I've got to know the answer. I can't know if I don't work. Okay? Another illustration, and I'll be done with this. I have read the book on, and I can describe to you how a car motor works. You don't ever want me taking a wrench to it. Because I don't work with them, therefore I don't know them. I just know terms. I, oh, that's a carburetor. I, okay. Jesus said, take my yoke. Work for me and learn about me. Now, might your work be big, huge, everybody look at, wow, look what they're doing. Might it be insignificant, nobody's impressed? But it's still work. It's what God told you to do. You go to a school. I use that as my illustration. Okay. You go to a school. What impresses you about the school? The building. The science teacher. You know, you know the school has janitors? Nobody ever thinks about the janitor. School has a secretary. You don't think about the secretary when you're calling in or something, but you think about the principal and the teachers. Does any of them have a job that's not important? Okay, so why, who puts the higher value on stuff? We do. Have, having worked in a school for 30 years, I'm glad there were janitors. Listen, janitors are really important. We had a guy at Springfield, and basically, not his only job, but basically his job during the school year was keep the grass cut. He did other things, but... 85% of his time was cutting grass. We had 50 acres of property. Part of that 50 acres of property were soccer fields. I coach soccer. So we go out to play a home soccer game and the field ain't cut or striped. The nets aren't up. Was that janitor's job important? Yeah. When a couple hundred people come to watch a soccer game, it's got to be cut and don't get mis misconstrued here. Your job is important, just as important as the next guy's. It's different, but it's important. Okay? Take my yoke upon, me, uh, upon you, learn of me. Why? Look what he says here. This is why you should do this, because I am meek and I'm humble. And you'll find rest under your soul. Most of the 
angst that humanity faces. The, the nerve, ugh, you know, you've all felt that way before, haven't you? Bear with me. If you want to argue with me, you're wrong. So just mark it down. 90% or more of the angst we feel is when we get into a ugh, situation because we've lost our humility. And I'm angst because it ain't going my way and it should be going my way because I deserve to have it my way. Why isn't it going my way? Something's not right. People aren't treating me right. That's where angst comes from. Jesus said, take my yoke. Learn about me. I am meek and I'm humble. And you'll find rest. You want to find rest to your soul? Get off your high horse and learn about God. Faithful work brings rest. Point number three. Work. All work brings results. If you work, something's going to happen. If you work half-baked, the results are going to be half-baked. If you work really well, you're going to get decent results. Remember this. Every decision has a consequence. Can't avoid it. Every decision you make is going to have an end result. Good, proper, right decisions always end up with good results. Every stinking time. Bad decisions, bad choices, always, every time, end up with bad results. Never the other way around. Well, I remember that one time. Okay, in your mind, go back and trace it through. Did you do the right thing? If it ended up wrong, somewhere in there is the wrong stuff. The right stuff never ends up bad. Never. Okay? Look what it says here. All work brings results. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6 says this, and going on after that. Let him that is taught in the word, in this situation, that would be you. But listen, this week I was taught in the word because I was developing this. Okay? So let all of us, we're taught in the word. Let him that is taught in the word communicate with him that teaches. Now, specifically, Paul is writing to the church of Galatia. And let me throw this in real quick. Everybody listen. Look at me. This is important. This is, this is not in your notes. So look at me. When you read a passage out of the Bible, it's important to know what book you're reading. And it's important to know what shelf in God's library you took it off of. Was it the history books? Was it the poetry books? So forth. What, what, what is it? You can't read every book of the Bible and say, I'm just going to read them the same. I want to apply it directly to me. Some things aren't meant to be applied directly to you. They were applicable to that in that situation. Who's being... Now, is the, is the truth applicable? Yes, but is the exact action applicable? Not always. So be, watch what you're reading. Know what you're reading. Rightly divide the word of truth. Okay, so look what it says here. Let him that is taught in the word communicate with him that is teaching with all good things. What Paul is writing to the church of Corinth... and. The, I like this verse because it says, y'all out there in the, in, the, in the pews, in the seats, take care of me. That's what he's saying. It says communicate. It has nothing to do with talking. The word communicate actually comes from the Greek word that means your lifestyle, your way of action, your interaction. As you are interacting with the guy who's teaching you in all things, do the right thing. Later on, Paul, Paul through inspiration, says, now, you ought to take care of him. Make sure that he has the time. He doesn't have to go out and do something. And you all have taken care of me just fine, so I'm not griping at all. I'm just, that's the context of this. Okay? Then he says this to us. He says, now, don't be mistaken. Don't be deceived. God cannot be fooled. He's not mocked. Whatever you sow is what you're going to reap. That statement is predicated by what? If you're taught in the word, take care of the guy who's teaching. Don't be deceived. God isn't mocked. The way you dish it out is the way you're going to get back. When I was, let's see, eight years old. Yes, I was eight years old. 
I started selling stuff door to door. Burpee seeds. Christmas cards. Eggs. Honey. Cut the grass. Grit newspaper. How many remember grit? <laughs> grit newspaper. I sold those door to door. I started when I was eight. I kept doing that to one degree or the other until I was, oh golly, 16, 17 years old. And I never, ever failed to give to the church. Now for me, this doesn't have to be for you, this is just for me. I always gave at least 15 to as much as 50% of what I got. I just always have, okay? You don't have to. You can give whatever God tells you to do. That's what he told me to do. All right? So I did. I've never not done that. Why? Because God says support the ministry. Don't labor to be rich. Take care of the people at the church. So I did. I was an 8, 9, 10-year-old kid. No, I'm giving, I'm giving 50% of my income. It was a buck and a half. You know? But I only made five bucks this week. I'm 63, and I have an in-ground pool with a cage on it in southern Florida, and it's paid for. How'd that one happen? God, God says, put me first. I'll take care of you. I got it taken care of. All right. Don't be deceived. The way you dish out, the way you're going to get back. Notice that's not a gift. That is a payment. That's an installment plan, as it were. Now, your motivation should not be, and mine was not, well, if I do this, God will take care of me. He'll get, no, I'm going to do this because it's the right thing to do. God will take care of me however he wants to take care of me. Okay? Look at verse 8. For he that sows to the flesh shall reap of the flesh corruption. If you're sowing to the flesh, if you're doing this for selfish reasons, if you're, if you're giving to something just because I want the tax break or something, that's not what it's about. But if you sow to the Spirit... You shall reap life everlasting. What's your motivation? And fo folks, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. Check your motivation. Why are you doing what you do? Now, what you're doing is important. There are some things the Bible says don't do that. There are some things the Bible says you have to do this. There's a lot of things the Bible doesn't talk about. So my question is, why are you doing it? Not because it's wrong, but why are you doing that? The Bible doesn't say you have to. The Bible doesn't say you, don't have, you can't. But why are you doing it? What's your motivation? God says, I know your heart. Would you like your reward? Will you work for me? Why are you where you are doing what you're doing the way you're doing it? But all work will bring a result. Verse 9. Don't be weary in well-doing. For when the time is right in due season, we will get the result if we don't faint, if we don't stop. So we're supposed to be working for God. God will take care of us. Your motivations have to be right, and you have to be patient. How many of you go to work tomorrow's Monday? You're going to go to work tomorrow, Monday, and at the end of the day, your boss gives you your paycheck. And you go to work on Tuesday, at the end of the day, he gives you your paycheck. On Wednesday, you work for the day, and he gives you your paycheck. Anybody work like that? What, you work all week? Knowing that you're supposed to and probably will get paid on Friday or whatever. God says, the, pay, the paycheck's coming. Just be patient. Don't be worrying. Well, don't get to, oh, I'm not going to work hard today. I mean, I haven't gotten paid since Monday. Oh, since last Friday. And it's the Wednesday. I, he hasn't, no, he's going to pay me every Friday. When it's done. Okay. Don't be weary in well-doing. You will reap if faint not. As ye, as we, as you, as I, have therefore an opportunity, do good to everybody. Now, especially do good to those who are Christians, the household of faith. Now, as Christians, what would theoretically be probably the most people you see most of the time most often? other Christians. You may not work in a place full of Christians, but you, you, you come to service, you have over to your house and so forth, 
the Christian brotherhood to, to fellowship. He says, now do good to everybody. Don't treat anybody wrong. But when it comes to Christians, be really, really ready to treat them right. Be willing to treat them right. Because all work brings results. And the way you dish it out is the way you're going to get it back. Okay? Number four. Submissive work brings happiness. You could use the word humble if you wanted to, but I got submissive, okay? Jesus, Jesus is talking in John 13, verse 13. You call me, he says to his disciples, you call me Master and Lord, and you say, you, you say well, because that's what I am. Y yeah, that's great. You, 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 you acknowledge verbally who I am. And that's good. You, you understand. You admit that. If I then, your Lord and Master have washed your feet, humbled myself, and done the, the menial task, what should you be doing? Shouldn't you also watch, wash each other's feet? Now, I've given, Jesus said, I've given you an example so that you will do what I have done. Now, was Jesus speaking specifically and only about washing people's feet? No, but is, that a, is it applicable? Could, you, could we do it? We will have a foot washing service here at our church in the near future. Do you have to do it? No. What was the point Jesus was making? I've humbled myself. You humble yourself. How far did I humble myself? I humbled myself down to I was washing your feet. Will you humble? Well, you know, I did park one parking spot over the one I really wanted to. Really? That, that's as humble as you get? Mm -hmm. I know when I was walking, walking up to the door, I actually pulled the door open and let them go in first. Yay. How humble are you? Jesus said, I've washed your feet and I've given you an ex example. Can you follow the example of humility? Look what he says here. Verily I say unto you, verse 16, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know that's true, and you do, happy are ye if you do it. You call me Lord and Master, and you're not greater than me. Because the servant isn't greater than the master. That's just, we all get that. The boss has got the corner office, and you park on the backside a lot. Okay, that's, how, that's life. You know that's, a, that's okay. So if you saw me do it as your example, you'll be happy if you do this. Humility, submissive work will bring you happiness. If the first thing on your mind when you're going to work is, oh, I deserve a raise, they better give me a raise, isn't it time for the Christmas bonus? I won't go to another job before I ask them what all the benefits and the perks are. You're probably going to be somewhat miserable somewhere along the line. Sooner or later, somebody financially is going to disappoint you. Okay? What's the Bible tell us in the book of Proverbs? Labor not to be rich. Cease from thy understanding. Stop thinking like that. Work is not about your paycheck. God paves his streets with gold. He'll take care of you. Okay? Don't worry about it. Now, do you know that you're going to have X amount of money you've got to pay out at the end of the month for your bills? Yeah, okay. So I know I can't work for a nickel an hour. It's, God, where do you want me to work? I want you to work there. But they're only paying a nickel an hour. That's where I want you to work. If that's where God wants you to work, will your bills get paid with you making a nickel an hour? Yes. Yep. They will. Okay. They will. I taught school at Springfield for 22 years. I left Springfield after 22 years making 16000 a year. That was the year 2000. How many of you were married, had nine kids, and had been in the same place for 22 years, and you only made 16000 bucks? Never missed a meal, never had anything repossessed. My house is paid off in Florida. God says, don't labor to be rich. Trust me. It will always work out. Now, it may work out differently for you than it did for me, but it will work out. I guarantee you. All right, number one, two, three, four, we've done. Honest, faithful work, submissive work, brings nourishment, rest, results, and happiness. 
Moving very quickly then. Number five, righteous work brings life. The labor of the righteous tends to life. And I can't get any clearer than that, can it? The labor of the righteous tendeth to life. The fruit of the wicked tends to sin. The Bible says if you will work for God with a right heart, he'll keep you alive. Okay? Why did the three Hebrew children not burn up in the fiery furnace? God says, I need those three guys to be my witness. Why did Daniel not get eaten by the lions? I need Daniel for a witness. You live a righteous life. You serve God righteously. He'll keep you alive. Does that mean you'll never die? No, no. It's appointed the man who wants to die. But Methuselah lived almost a thousand years. Okay? Cato lived to be a hundred plus. But he was a testimony. He was a witness. Listen. Will God keep a faithful witness around as long as he needs him to be here until he gets a replacement? Okay? Try to make yourself irreplaceable. Okay? We'll move on. Number six. Focused work brings prosperous security. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, Matthew chapter 6 says in verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everything else will be taken care of. It says all these things will be added unto you, but you read the verses before that. You're worried about clothes and food and house and shelter. and all. Mm -hmm. Seek God first and do the right thing, and it'll be taken care of. Therefore, take no thought for tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. And there's the thing in Proverbs chapter 23 I read to you before. Labor not to be rich. If you seek God's kingdom first and do what he wants you to do, everything will be taken care of. You will have prosperous security. It doesn't mean you'll be living on the big mansion up on top of the hill and every, you'll be the governor. It doesn't mean that. No, you'll have prosperous security. I am very prosperous. I'm 63, my house is paid off. That's cool. <laughs> I live on Social Security. But I don't have any bills. I have to buy food. You know? I can, I can do that. I'm secure. I'm prosperous. God has taken care of me. Listen. Seek God's kingdom first. Live for God. Do the right thing. That doesn't mean I've done right every time. I've, I've messed up many times. But what happens? The Holy Spirit gets a hold of my heart and says, Dave, knock that thing off. You confess it. You repent. Surrender to God. And he gives you a brand new slate like it never happened. Hallelujah. Man, that's great. Then you do it again. You say, oh, Lord, forgive me again. He says, what are you talking about? Well, this was gone the first time. You did it again. Confess, repent now. But this ain't the second, third, fourth, fifth, first time. Clean slate. Okay? What sins are you talking about? You don't have to keep confessing about the same thing over and over and over and over again. It's not how it works. Number seven. Personal work equals personal cost. Now, how many of you go to work? Uh, you don't go. Your surrogate goes. And when your surrogate goes to work every day, at the end of the week, they send you the check. Anybody? No. Nobody goes to work for you? No. Personal work means a personal cost. Three things here, it says here in 2 Samuel. David is giving a sacrifice, and he goes up to the threshing floor of Arana, and he says, I, I want to buy this piece of property. I want to buy your ox. I want to buy your, your cart so I can make an altar and, and a sacrifice. And Arana says, no, here, I'll give them to you. And David says, no, I will not offer to God something I didn't have to pay for. It's got to cost me something to be real. Folks, are you willing to make a personal cost part of your life? Well, you know, God just, is, he just wants too much and it costs too much and I don't have the time or the, I don't have the money. I don't have... Then go away. Don't do anything. But if you don't do the work of him that sent you, you don't get the reward. 
Well, what's the reward going to be? I don't know. You mean I'm supposed to work for a mystery? Yep. So that my motives will be right. But I need to let myself surrender to the fact that there's a personal cost to service. We see in the Second Timothy, a verse I quote very often, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That takes work. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Sanctify the Lord God in your heart, and be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asketh you a reason for the hope that is, uh, that is in you with meekness and, and fear. If I'm going to be ready to give an answer, I've got to study to show myself approved, so I'm ready to do it. That takes personal time, personal cost. I can't sit around and read my favorite magazine and watch my, my TV shows all the time and play my video games all the time and walk around the park and play tennis all the time. Sorry about that, Jamie. Uh, I, I can't do all that all the time. There's got to be some time, somewhere, that i got to sit down and say, it's got to cost me something in order for me to value it. So take some time out of your personal time and personally work at personal cost. Let it be real. If it's worth having, it's worth working for. Make it personal. Make it real. Number eight. Last point. Saving work. It has nothing to do with me. So this is really kind of a misnomer. Can I save myself because of what I do? I'm working really hard? No. For by grace are ye saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It can't get any clearer. So when it comes to saving work, I can't do it. Somebody did it for me. But once I have received the gift of salvation that somebody else, Jesus Christ, paid for and offers freely, doesn't it just seem reasonable that I would act differently because I've received such a great, wonderful gift? Something that there's no way I could ever get to afford it, to be able to get it, to be able to make it, to find it, to pre I, there's I need it so badly, and I, there's no way I can get it. And here comes somebody who says, here, I bought it, here it is for you. Shouldn't that change my life in respect to that person? Shouldn't I honor him? And he says, take my yoke upon you, learn of me. Seek my kingdom first. You'll get all that. So we see honest, faithful, submissive, righteous, focused, personal, and saving work. There they are. That's my challenge to you today. Work for God. If you haven't been doing it wholeheartedly, start right now. Make him the focus of your life. Everything for Jesus, because nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. All right? Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we thank you for your love for us. Help us, Lord, to take the truths of your word and apply them to our lives so that we can be the kind of Christians, the kind of children, the kind of ambassadors, the kind of testimonies, witnesses that we ought to be for you. Lord, you've done so much for us, treated us so well. Way, way past anything we would ever deserve because we don't deserve anything. Help us, Lord, to serve you wholeheartedly. For it's in the name of Christ I pray. Amen. Well, ushers. I'd play music, but I can't get it to play. So think of a melody in your head and give a lot of money as they come forward. <laughs>